Hello and welcome back to JLXP, episode 64. I actually realized the other day that I'd passed a milestone with the JLXP episodes. I had done more JLXPs since coming back than I had done before leaving the first time, which I thought was pretty cool. And hopefully plenty more to come. This kind of midweek 10 Thoughts edition where I go over the 10 Thoughts article while just kind of adding some random bits, I think is pretty repeatable. So I'm going to continue to try doing it and then also continue to do the LCS recaps on Monday morning as as many of you watched. Um, so let's get into this week. I I started off the, the article talking about the term like dog days of summer. And this is definitely... It didn't originate in baseball. It's just the place that I heard it the first is there's this point in the Major League Baseball season because they play like 160 plus games where when they're like 120 games in, it's still 40 games away from the playoffs. Several teams feel doomed, but even the teams that aren't doomed are just kind of plotting their way through the summer. So fewer people watch baseball, fewer people care about baseball before it kind of ramps up for the playoffs. I feel like that's the spot where we are in, in like LCS right now, always the middle to tail end of summer before summer playoffs and ultimately before worlds, because worlds is the massive moment when most people pay big attention to league of legends is just a time where excitement is generally a little bit low for league of legends. And I made a joke about it in the article where like in baseball, they call it dog days of summer in league of legends. Reddit just says league of legends is dying because like, if you pay too much attention to that stuff that you see on the front page of Reddit, you get super depressed. And I think there's absolutely no need for that. If you're just looking to be a hardcore or casual fan of league of legends, like just enjoy the content, consume the content, support it. And you'll keep getting it kind of like this, kind of like this podcast. If you keep watching, I'll keep doing it. So with that being said, uh, I want to touch on one other thing before I go into the teams. Did you know only Evil Geniuses has a win streak longer than one game? It's crazy to me. And it, it supports this feeling I have of every time we give a team props, they fall on their face. And then every time you kind of cut a team down or say they're not delivering, they'll win because everyone has actually just been trading games with each other for so much of the split, which is creating these really wonky feelings. There's always a level of volatility and wonkiness with best of ones, which I've become accustomed to, but it definitely felt more accelerated in the past week or so. And that's why. So in 10 thoughts, if you haven't read it, I did something a little strange. I don't exactly know why I did it, but, uh, well, I'll I'll walk you through the thought process. Back when I was doing the 10 Thoughts podcast with Keen back in 2020, he, we did like this mid-split awards thing, but he called it like mid-split Oscars. And he came up with all these cool award categories that we awarded rather than just doing like, oh yeah, mid-split MVP, mid-split first team. So I tweaked that a little bit and somehow I arrived on assigning a high school yearbook style quote to every team. I just like Googled a bunch of high school yearbook quote. There's like hundreds of them online that you may have found in a high school yearbook. And that's the title for each team. I found one that I felt fit the overall feeling of the team to try and, you know, spice up the dog days of summer of the 10 thoughts piece. So, okay. Number one, EG, most likely to brighten up your day. And Last week, I talked about how I wasn't willing to crown this team LCS champions after three weeks. I'm still not ready to crown them LCS champions after four weeks, but they definitely have solidified themselves very solidly as the top team. They were down early game against TL, but like they seemingly always do, are just way better than everyone else in team fights. They also picked the scale. Danny did it again, basically, with Ezreal. It was Ezreal Yumi. There was nothing TL could do against the team comp. They moved their win streak to four games. I wrote a little blurb about how every player has something to be happy about. Danny is just... He continues to accumulate so many stats. It's like now a mountain of stats. And it almost makes me feel bad that I wasn't giving him as many props 
two splits or one split a go because he has been doing similar things to what he's doing this split for over a year. And I think EG recognized it, but I think the general league audience didn't. And I think he is still improving, and this is his best split. But yeah, he's been doing it for a while, which is something he should be happy about. Also, if you haven't been paying attention to Vulcan, his interviews with Travis, mainly his Twitter, he spent like weeks ratioing double lifts Twitter. He's super active. He has tons of memes that he generates. He's just a great guy, and he's any talent. Then you have JoJo. If you missed his his desk interview, he talked about the mids he played against at MSI, Faker, Shaohu, Caps, and how unselfish they were. And JoJo was already, by NA standards, a fairly unselfish laner. But I think hearing that from him and how he's internalized that to roaming more makes him an even more dangerous player, especially when the rest of his team is playing so well. Then we have Inspired, who like literally is playing probably better than he ever has, and he was the LEC MVP. And Impact is a player that like I actually think is having a even more of a resurgence. He's always been like top half of the LCS, but the fact that he's been top half of the LCS for like seven or eight years does, I think, make him the best NA top of all time, but he's also having one of his best splits ever. So really impressive that he's just been able to stay at this high level for so long, and that's cool. Most likely to brighten up your day. Any player, pick your pick your favorite and puts a smile on your face. Okay, next one. <clears throat> Hunter Thieves, six and three. Most likely to put something off until tomorrow. And that's still, honestly, how I feel about this team. I've called them boring. Uh, there's definitely a lot of people that think I just hate them for no reason. There's people that are like, yeah, but they're six and three. Like they keep winning. But like, they got dragon stacked on very quickly by FlyQuest. FlyQuest had four dragons pretty much before 100 Thieves tried to do anything. Um, well, it was like three and a half dragons before they tried to do anything, and then who he face checked his Yasuo and died. But then the next day against COG, they actually played like a really good early game, smashed them. COG did try a lot of stuff, which made it seem, I think, a little bit more aggressive than it was. And then they won. Like, I, I completely expect 100 Thieves to be in full contention for a title, especially come playoffs, when they turn it on. But, like, they're just putting it off for the most part. Like, they need a constant reminder that they can't slack off. Otherwise, they're going to slack off. And that's just, I think it's the truth. It's how I feel about this team. If, if they're performing badly, it's not because they're bad. And one of these days when you do that, you're not going to be able to turn it back on. But they consistently do. Like any time I say something bad about them or say that they're cooked or say that they're not good, they'll win and look good. So we'll see. Number three, Teal. Most likely to not change at all. Yeah, so to recap, they came into the split. They said they want to play through bot lane. They want to play more aggressive. But what does that really mean? Because they said that, and then in their 100 Thieves game two weeks ago, they played very slowly, lost. We're like, okay, we're going to change that. We're going to play through bot. We're going to play very aggressive. Lucian Nami, both games, bam. They obliterated the Golden Guardians, who were a little bit like COVID boomed. They had shown up to the studio, gotten kicked back to the facility. I think were a little bit mental boomed, and they played an early game team. Liquid, who played very well. So they just got really Goomba stomped. But then in the EG game, yes, with Zillion Volibear, Santorin, and Bjergsen did very well getting some kills and pressure 2v2 mid lane. The Lucian Nami got a little bit ahead, but then they actually got out team fought and outscaled by Danny, which I think is going to raise a really interesting question for this team. Like, whenever you try and change your style, but then get beaten by your old style, which is what I think EG did to them. It's very, very tempting to go back. Add that to the fact that all of these players are five-year-plus veterans. When push comes to shove, you almost always go to the things that work for you in the past. Therefore, TL, most likely to not change at all. All right, number four, COG, five and four. The most accident-prone, if you missed this, which I'm sure a lot of you do because Jenkins is not exactly the most followed top laner on Twitter. 
but he just randomly tweeted in the middle of the week, got hit by a car, LOL, should be able to play tomorrow, and then attached a thumbs up picture. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Like, everyone asked, is he okay? Doku was playing in Academy. He is fine, right? But add that to the fact that they are a very aggressive team and things often go very wrong for them. They're good, they're exciting, they're entertaining, but they're, you know, they're definitely the most accident prone. I still do think they are improved. The five and four split is one win shy of what they got through the entire spring split. So at halfway point, they're at five wins. All of spring split, they were at six wins. I I think they'll get to nine, eight. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting actually tracking their wins um, because I'm going to, I'm going to do a thing with C9 later. Uh, and COG and FlyQuest and TSM and these teams, their their win totals are actually going to be very, very important with where C9 is hitting in the eventual playoff picture. Okay, most likely to get ID'd when they're 30, FlyQuest. You know why? It's because Aphromoo turns 30 in two months. Did you know that? Like, he is the oldest player in LCS by over a year. But what's, like, the call out isn't to say, like, damn, he's so old. It's to say, damn, he's so good. And people five or 10 years ago, didn't think this was possible. And I just think that's a cool call out. And what I like about it is it's not like he's this old decrepit laner who just shot calls his team to victory. They've been winning early games. I didn't put the early game rating in the article because it's such a nuanced stat. But if you go to Oracle's Elixir, there's this EGR stat, which Tim has been doing for like five or six years. And it will, it's, it's a combination of not only gold lead, but also early game dragons. And it's benchmarked against like other games that have happened. So I think it's actually fairly accurate. Based on that stat, they're very close with the two teams in third and fourth, but they would have the second best early game in the league, which a lot of the time is through Aphromoo and Johnson laning really well. So I wanted to call that out. Also, they play Golden Guardians and Dig. So... Since I keep saying FlyQuest is better than 5-4, and four, they better freaking win against Golden Guardians and Dig and actually be 7-4 and four and actually be moving up towards uh, like high-tier regular season placement. Got to go all the way to number 6 to get to C9. 4-5. and five, Most changed. Hmm. So they did indeed lose to Immortals. And I kind of make some sarcastic jokes here. Like, yeah, Summer Split's not going to be easy. Turns out when you kick the league MVP who led you to a 13-5 record, it's going to take some adjusting. Especially when you roll swap your Academy 80 carry to support, you bring a mid laner back from not playing in LCS in eight months, and you roll swap your previous mid laner back to top lane. Yeah, you're not going to have immediate success. Big shocker. They're still 4-2 and two with this roster, but keep in mind the teams they lost to in week one were hard teams that they may have also lost to if they had their full roster. So... The game that I that I want to play here is like actually tracking. Okay, so they're four and five now. Let's just they'll probably lose to EG. Hundred Thieves and TL games are going to be tight. They could win, could lose. I'd say at the moment they wouldn't be favored. If they lost those three games and beat everybody else. They'd still only be 10 and 8. So if they drop a single game, if they lose to the three, if they drop a single game, COG, FlyQuest, Golden Guardians, TSM, Dig Immortals, they did just lose to Immortals. I don't think they'll go 6 and 0 against those teams. So if they go 1 2, 2 1, basically, it's very, very easy for this team to end 9 and 9, maybe 8 and 10 if things go a little bit awry and eight and 10 is where it would get really dicey because the way the playoff format is, as it has been the last two years, yes, eight teams do make playoffs, but seeds seven and eight start losers bracket seeds. One and two get a full buy three plays six, four plays five. And you can find the whole bracket online. But what is important here is they, it really won't matter that much if they finish third to sixth. I think one and two are out of the equation. That's, That's for EG, Hunter Thieves, and TL to fight over. I'd be very surprised if Cloud9 can somehow make it up to top two. Um, And it just looks like they actually still have a lot of work to do. 
So I still think they can totally contend for a top four spot. And once you're in the top four, they have the talent to still win a title, but they're just further away than any of the other four. And I think that was really apparent last week. And we'll see how quickly they can actually put it together because it's not the like, oh yeah, Jensen's here. Zven and Berserker are here. Time to win. It takes some time. Golden Guardians, most opinionated. So a lot of this is just like about their drafts and it's the same thing I talked about last week, but they did it again. They did Seraphine Sejuani and Anero actually had this hilarious tweet this morning where he just pictured, he just sent a picture of Ole and it said, pick me the worst champion imaginable, like as a quote. And that, like, that's how those things start. Uh, and I, I hope they keep doing it. It's very hard to sustain this. At the start of the year, this was like the CLG thing where, yeah, they're the ones that are going to be really creative in draft and they're going to be able to generate victories off of it. But Golden Guardians has been doing it more consistently. So there's three big games that come to mind. It was the Senamundo they did against TSM, which won. There's also a Sena Yasuo game, which failed horribly. And then there was this one, which would be the Seraphine Sejuani game, which worked very well against Dignitas. So in terms of like going for big hits and home runs in draft, I'd say they hit two, struck out once, which is worth it when you're a four and five or five and four middle of pack team fighting for a top six so you don't start playoffs in loser's bracket. So it's exciting. You want to keep watching them. TSM, biggest drama king. Yeah, I mean, you cannot tell me you're not excited to see what TSM does. People are excited to see what TSM Academy does. There's a lot of negativity there. I would want it to be more positive. When they do well, it's actually really good for the league. I, I was going to say, yeah, it, it actually is good for the league when they do well because there are so many closet TSM fans that don't want to come out because there's so much negativity around it. And they lost to C9, big top cap. Fudge hard carried that one on Gangplank. Next game, Instinct gets a freaking pentakill. Chime wins player of the game. And then Soul was one of the most charismatic interviews we've had in LCS in a very long time. He also stopped by Hotline League. Like, he could be a very big league personality. And that's after seeing him for a week. Now, if it's, that's, that's just, like, the person. I can't make a declaration on the player yet. And I think it would be very unlikely if they did something crazy, but you know there's going to be drama. So on paper, right, they play 100 Thieves Saturday, probably loss. Immortal Sunday, probably win. Maybe they end the week on another happy note. But also, as I said at the start of the podcast, it's not going to happen like that. Like it's not going to happen like it's going to be on paper. So I think it's either a 2-0 or a 0-2. Just because the TSM is the kings of drama. Also, by the way, Hooney's coaching. They updated the global contract database. It's now Chawi and Hooney on stage. Kaze is not in the database. I'm not sure what's going on there, whether he's just off stage still coaching or something else happened entirely. They haven't clarified that as of the time I'm recording this. I'll update when news happens about that, but I don't really know what's going on, as is a lot of things with TSM. But they're going to be very entertaining okay this was a goofy one so i'm not going to spend too long on it dignitas best candidate for the cia now the way the way the timing of this works is i write the article it goes to law esports to be published and then i record the podcast in between this happening dig announced that spawn their academy 80 carry is going to be playing in lcs so that would have been something interesting to write about And I may not have even written about Biofrost making a great CIA agent. But (laughs) that's where we are at because I did write about that. I'm going to talk about it just a little bit. So part of the reason I did the whole like high school yearbook style awards was one, Dog Days of Summer, but two, like when you get to the bottom teams and 10 thoughts, I don't want to be an asshole and I want to find fun stuff to talk about. So uh, yeah, the one that fit them was they got the best candidate for the CIA. It's Biofrost. Hear me out. He's been on winning teams. means he works well with others. He's also been on terrible teams. So he can bring down organizations or governments from within. 
and he speaks multiple languages, English and Mandarin. Plus, he excels in high-pressure situations, doesn't get emotional. I don't know if he's an American citizen, so that would be a big strike against him. I think he's Canadian with a work authorization in the U.S., but I'm not sure. Maybe he qualifies. I haven't looked into his paperwork. But, uh, you know, he's taken a year off and gone back to LCS before. What did he really do in that year? Nobody knows for sure. Okay, Immortals, final team, best smile. If you missed this, which I'm sure many of you did because I think they were the last game of the day, Flowers was very excited to see Immortals win. Power People was smiling on the camera and he just screamed like, look at his face. He's so damn happy. I love that. And I asked him afterwards and it was because like he was so sad. He was so, so tired of just looking at PoE and the rest of Immortals just be sad after they lose. But they pulled the upset on C9. PoE did carry that game on Corky. And it offers that slight glimmer of hope that any losing team is looking for. And it is still true that at the start of the split, they had zero days of practice, less than any other team in the league, which is always going to make you look worse than you really are when compared to the other teams that had adequate practice time. So I don't expect them to contend to a title, but they do have a chance of being not the worst, which is something I was so sure that Immortals was not the worst team in spring. I am currently not sure about that in summer, but there's a chance. And that does it for for 10 thoughts this week. One small note about uh, like discoverability for this podcast. There, I'll just go into it now for the people that made it to the end of the video. Uh, Reddit, I think, is still a source for discoverability. I get very low click-through on Reddit threads, but I think a lot of people actually see things on Reddit and then rather than clicking the link, obviously tons of comment readers, but like just to know that something is happening, they'll check it out. Since I have been so inconsistent about doing midweek episodes, I think there's a lot of people that don't actually know that I'm doing this. So uh, there are rules around Reddit about posting your own content. So just letting people know, I do really appreciate it. If anyone, when this post or when they see it, just makes a submission on Reddit, so that there's a chance more people see it and I can read a different source of comments. I still think like the best comment source is the YouTube comments. Back when I was doing the old JLXPs and the Reddit stuff was more active, like I'd read the Reddit threads, maybe there's more negativity. The YouTube comments have always been like super positive, which wasn't the case say 10 years ago, but it is the case now. But anyway, just uh, I guess request, I would really appreciate it when I do these episodes if people check it out on Reddit as well to see the discussion there and help more people discover it so it can grow. That's it for this time, and uh, I'll see everyone next week. Thanks.